Good day to you. I'm Carl Falk. This is the Falcon Around Podcast. Hope you're having a good Tuesday morning or whatever day it is that you happen to be consuming this podcast. We thank you for your continued support of the podcast. It's been fun through the pandemic, and it's been even more fun for me now that we have actual sports to talk about, or at least we hope we're going to have more sports to talk about. As the calendar flips to mid-August, This is the time of year where training camps are open in the NFL. We are less than a month away from the opening kickoff. And in college football, theoretically, of course, we're only a few weeks away. They generally start a week earlier than the NFL. Start Labor Day weekend. There's always a couple big games. But the question today and the question for the next couple weeks is going to be if and when college football begins. It's already been changed quite a bit from the schedules that were set up many, many months ago. They've been tweaked to be just in-conference schedules to accommodate more time should a team need to go Miami Marlins, St. Louis Cardinals, shut down for a couple weeks because of a COVID outbreak. Well, this weekend, led by the Big Ten and their presidents, it looks as though college football may be very close to a season that never begins. And It's not going to be just that simple. It's not going to be, that's it, we're shutting down. What's amazed me, if you followed this story over the last couple weeks, the way it's come about has been the Big Ten had a meeting with its presidents, and reportedly 12 to 2, the vote was that they were not going to play football this fall. As a matter of fact, they were hoping possibly to, to play in the spring. Whether or not that's feasible is a different argument for a different day. I I personally don't think it is. The effect on all sports that it would have, I think, is the bigger story. And we'll get to that in a little while. But after the Big Ten did that, the other Power Five conferences, and you're hearing that a lot, Power Five conferences. If you don't know what the Power Five conferences, it's the Pac-12, the Big 12, the Big Ten, the SEC, and the ACC. Syracuse plays in the ACC. Those are the the Power Five conferences that essentially control college football. On Friday, it was announced that the Mid-American Conference, the MAC, will not have football this year. University of Buffalo has become a very strong program regionally and is a growing program. Lance Leipold, the head coach there, has done a phenomenal job not only developing talent for UB, but a couple real good pro prospects, including their running back, Jared Peterson, Patterson, who this year might have been one of the first running backs taken with another strong season, which I fully would have expected him to have. But now UB has decided that's not going to happen. Now, there's still a chance that this season is saved and the Power Five conferences play. It's unlikely, in my opinion, that the Pac-12 comes to the table and says, yep, we're going to play. The Pac-12 in California, and California right now is a mess with COVID. They have shut back down a good portion of the things that had opened back up. They have announced that students won't be on campus for much of the fall semesters at the state universities. So you think about UCLA and USC. Stanford has already announced that they've cut some sports back. I just don't see the Pac-12 playing football this fall. I think what may possibly save everything is a delay in the start of the season. And you're hearing a lot of things from a lot of different people. The sports writers who cover the sport are talking about this and, and putting information out. And while that information is largely negative to a season being played, People are accusing the sports writers of rooting for it to not be played. Well, that's not the case. They're putting information out that is the information they're getting. And frankly, that information is not in favor of people playing football this fall. One of the big factors, reportedly, is an after effect or possibly a side effect from COVID-19. It is a heart issue that we've seen in a couple athletes that have played Eduardo Rodriguez of the, of the Boston Red Sox has dealt with this where a a young athlete recovers from COVID, but a 
heart problem caused by COVID needs attention. And that's a serious issue. Anytime you're talking about potentially open heart surgery or even any kind of heart surgery, you're talking about a serious, serious issue. And the, the liability issue for colleges is a real concern. And I understand that greatly. But there are so many dominoes that go along with this. And I think this is something that people miss. We talk about college sports and the lack of amateurism and the fact that these guys often make billions of dollars for the NCAA and the universities that they play for. And yet they're only only compensated a scholarship worth about seventy-five dollars to $80,000 a year. I've always felt that if you want to talk about paying athletes, you can stipend athletes because of Title IX. You can't just say we're going to pay the quarterback this, we're going to pay the running back this, lineman this. Oh, the, the women's swim team? No, they're not getting paid. It's a non-revenue sport. Well, Title IX says you cannot do that. It's all about equal opportunity. And if you have the opportunity to make money playing one sport, you have to have the opportunity to make money playing your sport as well. So Title IX says it's not that simple. But the cancellation of these, this potential football season, or I should say the potential cancellation of this football season, is going to have a much bigger effect on the economic landscape of all colleges. And I don't just mean the sports landscape, because you're going to see what Stanford has already done. Cancel and eliminate sports. Anytime you eliminate sports from a university, What you've done is eliminate students' opportunity to go to that university. Stanford is a great example because not only is it a a national power in many different sports, it's not a national power in football, but it's a very good football school, very good basketball school, but they do great in women's volleyball. They're, They're always up there in softball. They're a great golf school. There are a lot of other sports that they do really well in. And generally, there's a trophy awarded each year in college athletics that encompasses all sports. And Stanford is one of the leaders and one of the winners annually of that trophy for having the best athletic program. Well, they're now canceling sports. That means students are going to lose their scholarships. And that means students who are enrolled at Stanford now go from maybe having to pay $35,000 a year because they have a partial scholarship to the $75,000 or $80,000 a year everyone else has to pay. That's opportunity. That's people not getting a Stanford education. And a Stanford education is something that you put on a resume and it opens doors for you. That is a real concern. In football, in large part, funds many athletic programs the fact that football is such a money maker it allows other sports to have their athletes scholarship and go to school so no football equals reduced opportunities and frankly that is something that i'm very concerned about what's crazy to me is this talk has been going on mark emmerich is the head of the ncaa Mark Emmerich has said absolutely nothing around this conversation. The NCAA is taking a back seat. The Power Five conferences are the ones we're hearing from. We're hearing from the head coaches. We're hearing from the players. The players have put out a hashtag, we want to play. Trevor Lawrence, the great quarterback from Clemson, and Justin Fields, the great quarterback from Ohio State, both tweeted this weekend saying things that, we, that end with the hashtag, we want to play. Players who could opt out and still be drafted number one and number two in next year's draft in the NFL, they want to play football. And Trevor Lawrence, I I give him a lot of credit because what he tweeted out was, was very real and very pertinent, that colleges have a setting where they can control the university and control the athletes. It's essentially a bubble. It's its own bubble. They brought kids back on campus. They essentially quarantined them. And now you've got a quarantine of a campus. And when kids are there, especially the athletes, they are being tested almost daily. And 
that it is a very much controlled atmosphere. Well, when you're not on campus, if there is no football, kids go back to wherever they're from, maybe take online classes, maybe don't take online classes, get back into the real world, and guess what? Then they're not having the safety protocols that the universities have in place. So Trevor Lawrence was absolutely correct. It's much safer to be on campus, be routinely tested, and to play football than it is to not be on campus and not have all of those doctors and all of those physicians looking after you to make sure you're safe to play football. The MAC conference, one of the reasons reportedly that they canceled is they don't have the money to continually test. I read a thing this morning that the University of Notre Dame has conducted somewhere in the neighborhood of 12,000 tests on their students who have returned to college, including their athletes. Point oh, uh, one third of 1% is what is tested positive. That's a 99.6666 with the line over the last six positive uh, negative rate. That That's incredible. That shows that you've got a fairly safe situation. And again, maintaining that through tests should allow that situation to continue safely. It's not a cut and dry answer. It's not about, I want to watch football. You want to watch football. It's not about that. It's about a lot of things, including the economics, as I touched on, not only is it opportunities for students, you're looking at kids looking to put on film their abilities to, for the draft and hopefully set up a future to play professional football. There's kids who are looking to use football to get an education. And of course, as I mentioned, the funding of other sports. Head coaches are a little different. They want to play and they want to play for a lot of reasons. One, any football coach is going to see things through the lens of football, not through reality, not through lot logistical talking. Scott Frost of the University of Nebraska, who barely has a job, I should mention, because he's not done a very good job at Nebraska. Fortunately, he was a good quarterback there, and they like him a little bit, so they're putting up with him. He said yesterday that if Nebraska and the Big Ten decide not to play football, that Nebraska is going to play out of conference. They're going to find games. They're going to have a season. I don't know if they can do that. I don't know what the case is. I want you to listen to Ryan Day, the Ohio State head football coach, on the resolve they have about playing football. Coach, Big Ten presidents right now are probably deliberating the future of this conference. They might be watching us right now as we're live on ESPN2. What do you want to say to them right now? I would say we, we, we cannot cancel the season right now. We have to, at, at the very least, postpone it. And, and allow us some, a little bit of time to keep reevaluating everything that's going on. That's the reason why we put this schedule together, to have some flexibility. If we need to take a deep breath, let's take a deep breath. Um, but let's, let's do everything we can. We owe it to these kids to exhaust every single option we possibly can, and then we go from there. Uh, but, but doing that right now, to me right now, would be abrupt. As expected, he wants to play football. He's going to got a chance to win a national championship this year. In a normal season, you would expect to see Ohio State being in the Final Four. He wants to hang 100 on Jim Harbaugh because Harbaugh got after him in a teleconference last week at the Big Ten media or at the Big Ten coaches meetings. Harbaugh and Ryan Day have a little bit of a rivalry. And it, to me, this is college football. Rivalries are college football. Michigan, Ohio State is very much among the best. And, you know, when you've got the two head coaches basically coming out and saying we don't like each other, well, that's a good thing. Harbaugh also put out that the reasons he thinks college football should be played. Now, when you listen to coaches, understand this. A guy like Jim Harbaugh, who's never won a championship anywhere, he did take an NFL team to the Super Bowl, not winning the Super Bowl, lost to his brother. But at the same time, this is a guy paid $8 million a year to win 9 of 13 games each year, maybe 10 on a good year. He's overpaid, in my opinion. He's a good coach, not a great coach. And frankly, if you rank the coaches, he would be the most overpaid coach in college football, in my opinion. But at the same time, he wants to play. And 
what happens to coaches' salaries if they don't play? You know, think about that. A guy like Nick Saban, highest paid employee in the state of Alabama, if he doesn't get paid by Alabama because there is no season, does he become a free agent? Can he go elsewhere? There's going to be some college, some state somewhere that's willing to pay that guy. It is a money-making proposition. The other financial impact of college football, and I bring up Alabama for a reason, Tuscaloosa, Alabama, the economy of that small city is based on the University of Alabama. They figure that it is worth $2 billion a year for the University of Alabama to play football. Think about that. They play, what, six, seven home games a year? $2 billion. Amazing, the economic impact. The ESPNs of the world have a huge vested stake in this. Fox Sports has a huge vested stake. There are a lot of reasons economically that this season needs to go on. Logistically, safely, that's a different story. And that's where... College presidents are tasked with making decisions for people's children. It's not as though we get to make a decision for our children. You know, when you think about sending your kid to school right now, it's not necessarily the safest activity. Is it something that's necessary? And here's where difference of opinion rules. In my opinion, kids need school. They need the structure. They need the social atmosphere. But it doesn't mean it's safe. When you're talking about college football and college athletics, you're taking that to the next level. It's a very convoluted situation and one that's going on, uh, and it's going to continue to go on all year. It's going to affect college basketball as well. One of our biggest voices around here, especially when it comes to college basketball, is Jim Beheim. Here's his views on what should go this fall and into the winter. Well, what I see is with younger younger people under 25, there's nobody's dying. Anybody healthy is can get sick. 40 to 50 percent of the cases are are probably uh, with no effects. But when you see the football players coming back, and when they initially come back and test positive, that means they got it at home. Since they've been back on campus, these same football players are testing negative and are practicing already with no effects. Uh, you see that all over. You see the sports leagues that have started. There's there's been a couple little disruptions, but for the most part, these got healthy athletes either asymptomatic or they don't get anything from this disease. And I just don't see why we don't push forward like all the other sports have. And you're talking about college kids that are going back to school, and you're talking about high school kids that are going back to school. Because in my mind, this could go on for two years or three years. Are we just going to stop everything for two years or three years? I'm not a great believer in a vaccine. We The flu vaccine still doesn't work. And we've been looking for that for 30 years or so. So I don't see a cure coming. And if there's not a cure coming, are we just going to give up and sit home for the next two years? Not all that surprising to hear that the Hall of Famer wants to play. He's a tough old dude who looks at things and and he wants to play basketball. He knows also, I think he's got a pretty good team coming back this year. I think they can compete in the ACC, though. They've lost Elijah Hughes, who was a fantastic scorer and player. I think they've got an opportunity to grow with some of the freshmen they had last year and some of the things that have grown As a team and and, and as a university, I think that the Orange should be competitive. So, Beheim is going to want to play. All coaches are going to want to play. The reality is university presidents have a decision to make, and it's like many other decisions that our leaders have had to make. You have to balance the economics with the safety. And somewhere you've got to find a way to marry both. Sometimes it's not 
uh, you're not able to do that. And you have to choose either safety or economics. It's not a simple choice. It's not an easy choice. I don't know where it's going to go from here, but I would anticipate an announcement coming this week that college football is at least pushed back into October. And I think that might be the best way to go about trying to find out whether or not you can play. Let the next month and a half go by, see where you're at as far as the numbers here in New York State right now. The numbers relating to the coronavirus is are, are very good. Very, We should be in a pretty safe spot, but we can't just, all right, we're over it. It's not over. It's never going to be over until we get the vaccine. And until that happens, discussions like this are going to continue. Now, what's interesting is if there is no college football, you think of the windows that college football is consumed by us, the fan, on television. There's college football on every night of the week. There's now a need for programming. The NFL is going to play football. There are 4 billion reasons why the NFL will play football. That's the revenue that they'll make from television broadcasts this year without fans. With fans, the league is an $8 billion a year industry. Without fans, it's a $4 billion a year industry. That's why the NFL will play football. And if you look at the NFL and you think about the NFL playing this fall, if there is no college football, here's what I see happening. One, there will be at least two games on Saturday afternoons. You'll have a 4 o'clock window and an 8 o'clock game every Saturday. So the NFL, which dominates Sunday and has a game Monday night, those four games will be on TV. You add two to that on Saturday night. Thursday night football is another window. So now you've got Thursday night, two on Saturday, the three windows on Sunday and Monday night. That's seven windows of telecast you think the nfl won't include a friday night game as well last year fox sports used the pac-12 to play friday night double headers it was very successful they played an eight o'clock game or a seven o'clock game and then a 10 30 game out on the west coast it was great people loved it the nfl will jump on that as well that's eight games will be broadcast every week It does a lot of things. It satisfies the NFL's partners. It also puts their footprint in those windows. They've never competed with college football before. It was kind of a handshake agreement. You've got Saturdays and Fridays. We'll take the rest. Well, now the rest isn't there. And I got to think, once the NFL gets a taste of the ratings that come around on a Saturday or a Friday night, they're not going back. College football just created competition for those television windows. And the NFL is all about the dollars, and they're going to make it work for their partners and for them. One strange part of this, TV-wise, the NFL ticket has been DirecTV's calling card for years, since it began. And as somebody who, in the late 90s, got DirecTV because of the NFL ticket, I was able to watch every game. At that time, there was no Thursday night football. There were only a few games on that you would see, but yet with the ticket, you could watch anything. And if you were a fan of an out-of-town team, it was the way to go. Well, DirecTV and the NFL have continued to raise that price. Bars and restaurants got the NFL ticket, so they would get fans to come to their place, have drinks, watch games, eat food, spend money. The price on premise, that's bars, restaurants, has gotten out of hand a small little bar your corner neighborhood bar where you go in and it's occupancy is under a hundred it's about four thousand dollars a year right now for the nfl ticket that's why you're starting to see very few bars actually have it a bigger place you could play pay somewhere in the neighborhood of twenty thousand dollars to show those games that's a bad investment in the bar restaurant industry, an industry that's been crushed by COVID. It was a bad investment last year when there was no COVID. It's a worse investment now. And now that essentially on bye week, 75% of the games 
are going to be shown on regular TV anyway. You think about it, by week, there's only 12 games that are being played because you've likely got four, te- four games wiped out because eight teams sometimes are on, on by. You're looking at almost 75% of those games you can watch a regular. Why are you paying thousands and thousands of dollars to show this? So the question then becomes, well, isn't the NFL cutting the legs out from DirecTV? Well, yes, they are. And as a matter of fact, that contract between the NFL and DirecTV is in the final stages. The NFL is becoming a free agent in its own right for its exclusive broadcast rights. DirecTV, because of that, has been using it as a loyalty card. If you sign up, you get free NFL tickets. If you're a longtime subscriber like myself, they've given you the free NFL ticket to show their appreciation. Oh, they don't want to show their appreciation. They want to up their numbers of the NFL ticket subscriptions to allow the NFL to see what it's losing. There's a lot of money at stake here, and there's a lot of opportunity for broadcast, more money, and this is why we're in the situation we're in. So interesting to keep an eye on how the NFL handles that. couple other NFL not notes. Darius Geis, I found this intriguing because Geis is a running back coming out of LSU who, who looked great on film. Unfortunately, as the pre-draft process went through, many people found out that Geis had a lot of red flags, wasn't exactly a good character guy. Now, we hear about this quite often. This guy's not a good character guy. And there's always that guy who slides down draft boards because of his character. Randy Gregory, a couple years ago, coming out of Nebraska, many people thought he was the best pure pass rusher in the draft. He slid to the Cowboys middle of the second round. What a great pick. Great value. Hasn't been able to stay on the field. He's currently applying for reinstatement and theoretically has his life turned around, and I hope the young man does have his life turned around. But So many times we hear the concerns during the draft of a player like Geis, like Gregory, who have these red flags. And we as fans, we don't know. We don't spend the time investigating. But the teams do because these are huge investments. And eventually somebody's going to take a chance on a guy. And then you read that Darius Geis has been cut by the team formerly known as the Washington Redskins, he's been cut by that team because of a domestic violence incident where apparently he strangled his girlfriend to the point of her being unconscious. Look, I'm not a doctor, medical expert, I'm nothing. But if you strangle somebody till they lose consciousness, you're about a second away from strangling them to death. Darius Geis is almost a murderer. What's scary to me is this guy's a young man who can play football. He'll probably get another shot somewhere. How can you bring somebody like that into your organization? And not only that, pay them in excess of six figures. It's just mind-boggling to me. And if you look at what Geis has done in the NFL, he hasn't been able to stay healthy and stay on the field enough to show if he is a good player. So, It is really crazy to me to think about Darius Geis possibly getting back in the league. And I know that's a few years away, but it's probably something that I'll be talking about at some point when it happens and reminding people what this scumbag did over the weekend. I should say what he did allegedly. There was a column on ESPN this week that had the top talent under 25 years old in the NFL. And this is important because it shows your ability to draft. If you're bad in under 25-year-old players, you have not drafted well. You have drafted poorly. If you're good at the draft, you're going to have a lot of talent under 25. The top team under 25 is the Baltimore Ravens. It led largely because of Lamar Jackson. Jackson is a reason to be very excited if you're a Ravens fan for a long time, I, I'm still curious long term. Will he be able to do what he did last year? Where he's just so spectacular. Do defensive coordinators come up with a scheme that slow him down? Not not stop him. You can't. 
He's way too athletic and way too good. Greg Roman and John Harbaugh have done a great job of insulating him in an offense that fits his athleticism and fits his skill set perfectly. I think he's going to be great for a long time. I don't think he could be as good as he was last year when he was nearly unstoppable until the playoffs came around. So the Ravens were number one. If you're a Giants fan, I think your team is going to be poor this year. But you're number two. Daniel Jones, who showed a lot of positive things last year, is one reason why. And, of course, a guy who I think is one of the top three running backs in the league, Saquon Barkley, is the other. The Arizona Cardinals are number three. Kyler Murray, in large part, if you watched him play last year, you would have seen why Kyler Murray is so well regarded. This kid can throw the ball from different platforms. He could put it anywhere. He's as good a thrower of the football and as athletic as any quarterback in the league not named Patrick Mahomes. He is that good of throwing the football on the run different ways and his ability to run maybe second only to Lamar Jackson in the NFL right now. But your Buffalo Bills were number four. And to me, that was really impressive because we talk about this a lot. The national perception of the Buffalo Bills has more to do with one player than maybe any other team in the league. And that player is as polarizing to evaluate as any other player in the league, and it's Josh Allen. Allen is a guy who Bills fans love. Allen is a guy who critics who didn't like the draft pick back three years ago have not fallen in love with. They won't look at his two years in the NFL and and concede that he's improved. They just look at the consistent mistakes he makes now that were the same that he made in college. The same lack of quick read, react, the good throws are not usually shown by these people they're usually the bad throws that are thrown i've been a fan of allen since day one i I don't know what his ceiling is i don't know if he'll ever harness all that athleticism but i thought it was impressive that this list by bill barnwell of espn who's a very very smart man put a lot into josh allen and that's why the bills are for it but the other two players I don't want to say they're more important than Allen, but they need to be sure things. Allen's far from a sure thing. But the other two players that are the biggest reason why the Bills are at number four are Tremaine Edmonds and Ed Oliver. And these two guys, if the Bills are going to go where many people think they can go, it's going to be because the Bills' defense. Allen and the offense have a chance to improve greatly and take some heat off the defense. But that offense, even if Allen takes a big step forward, is it going to be one of the better offenses in the NFL? It's going to be an okay offense that scores enough points. The defense has a chance, again, to be a top five defense. And what could really push it over the top, in my opinion, is continued improvement by Tremaine Edmonds and Ed Oliver. Oliver last year showed glimpses. Uh, He was involved in a lot of plays as the season went along. He got better and better. It's always going to be tough for Oliver because he's not physically gifted and that he's a giant man. He's quick. He's relentless. He's got a skill set similar to Aaron Donald. I'm not comparing the players at all because Aaron Donald is the best defensive player in football right now, in my opinion. But Ed Oliver has a chance to grow into a poor man's Aaron Donald if he continues to, to improve his technique And I think the work he's putting in will allow him to do that. Edmonds last year took a huge step forward. I always thought Tremaine Edmonds was hesitant in playing middle linebacker. You didn't often see him shoot gaps and finish plays. You saw more of him reacting to a play and chasing a guy down or along those lines. Second half of last year, you saw more impact plays from Tremaine Edmonds that you had seen in the first year and a half. And to me, That's the mental side catching up with the physical side. The physical side is there in spades. This is a kid who's hugely huge in size for the middle linebacker position, almost 6'5", almost 240 pounds, runs like a deer. If his mental approach is read, react, continue to grow, I think the sky's the limit for this young man. And I honestly think that 
as good as Tredavious White is, Tremaine Edmonds has a chance in two years to be the best player on a great defense and the guy that around the league people are talking about is we need to find ourselves another Tremaine Edmonds. We need to find a guy like that. And there aren't many guys like Tremaine Edmonds simply because of his physical size. So keep an eye on that as things go forward. Training camp is going on, but it's it's very strange. You know, as somebody who spent the last four summers going out to St. John Fisher almost every day for practice, watching practice, observing listening to, to guys as, they, as they're playing the communication with their teammates, the fights, the coaches, all the things that go along in the camp. It gives you a great feel for the team. It gr- gives you a great feel for different players. This guy belongs. This guy's over his head. This guy's making strides. This guy is going to be packing up and going home. You see a lot of that just from the casual observer. And it's, it's amazing to be that close and be able to get that sort of interaction. And I don't mean interaction, that that much of an observation. Well, this year it's different because reporters, and they're not at camp. Practices are going on, and after practice, a couple players will jump on Zoom with reporters, and that's the information we're getting. We're not getting the feedback of who played well today. We're not seeing that Josh Allen was 9 of 13 but did throw a pick. We're not seeing Zach Moss breaking running backs. We're not seeing video. Coaches have to absolutely love this. It's much more controlled. It's not a circus. There are no fans. There's no media. Everything is about football. So Sean McDermott, I'm sure, is in love with the way this camp has gone. But it's just very strange because we, the fans, get a lot of information going forward that allow us to – dissect things in in a great way so it is very very good to see that the nfl camps are going on but at the same time it's a lot different and i do miss all the interactions that we have and you know frankly a lot of it was just talking to other people who cover the team getting in conversations and learning things or discussing debating all those sort of things that go a long way to helping your knowledge. So I want to give you an opportunity right now that can help yourself out. We all know what Instacart is. And in this day and age of the Corona pandemic, Instacart's become something that a lot of people have used so they don't have to mask up and go to the store and deal with all the things that can go there. Instacart can deliver your groceries in as little as one hour. And I'm going to give you an opportunity right now for your free delivery on your first order of over $35. There are multiple stores that you can stop. If you click on the link on the show notes, you'll be able to let Instacart know that we sent you there and they're going to help show their support and you'll receive free delivery. Multiple stores available, products you love from all your local stores, hand selected by shoppers based on your preference. Delivery to your door in as fast as one hour. Instacart highlights deals help you, that help you save money. Find everything you usually buy and get smart suggestions for new items. We pick the freshest produce and keep your eggs safe, too. Nothing worse than buying eggs, getting home, and having them or one of them broken. So click on the show notes. Click on that link, and they will allow you to go to Instacart and let them know that we sent you and you get your first delivery of over $35 for free just for listening to me. It's not a bad deal. Try it out. You know, one thing as we return sports to normal, one one sport seems to be working better than others. As we see, the NBA bubble is working great. The NHL bubble is working great, but the viewership is has not been great. The viewership in basketball, I think, has been affected a little bit by political situations. And, and there are, I've heard many people say, I won't watch. I won't watch it. Personally, I, I, I can't not watch. I, it's still the game that I love. And whether you believe one side or the other, 
I take politics out of it. I, I watch the sport. But some people can't do that. And I think basketball has been hurt to a degree by that. One sport that's not been hurt by politics at all is golf. You're hearing very little politically coming out of the golf world on either side. It is what it is. And this past weekend was the first major of the PGA Tour restart. And the first major of this season, if you will. And it was the PGA Championship. The PGA has long been a, a tradition in August, though last year for the first time they played it in May. In three years, it will be played in May at Oak Hill Country Club, just a couple miles from where I'm broadcasting right now here in Rochester. And as we hope that by then there will be many fans packing the lawns of Oak Hill, the, what they see in a major is different. Golf is different when it comes to a major. And, and the PGA is a different major than all the others. You, you have guys like Rich Beam win a major who never wins anything else. Sean McKeel at Oak Hill in 2003 winning the major and hasn't done anything since. Well, this week was different. Colin Morikawa won this major. And if you haven't heard of him before this weekend, you didn't watch a couple weeks ago at Muirfield Village when he got into a playoff with Justin Thomas and battled Thomas and eventually won that playoff. And, and to me, that was eye-opening. I, I look at this kid's game and I look at his demeanor and I, I really like what I see from this young man. But watching him on Sunday in a tour event, a, a championship that had a great leaderboard, it was really impressive. And this shot on 16 and this 16th hole, drivable par fours on the back nine on Sunday. If you're looking for a major course, it's something they should have. Check out how good this golf shot was and the resulting putt. thing to hit the drive but to finish it off with a putt that's dead center as well the kids nerves were, were non-existent it was great to see the young man play the way he did coming down the 18th hole he takes it right at the flag on 18 leaving himself an easy par that ensured the victory he is somebody i think that has a chance going forward to be a huge part of the story and i think what the huge part of the story is that this major was great in, in spite of who wasn't involved. On Sunday, of course, you had Colin Morikow, and he beat Paul Casey. Casey's been around for a long time, played very well. Dustin Johnson was on the leaderboard. Brooks Kapka was in the final group and struggled badly. So you had some big names up there. But you also had guys like Matthew Wolf, who's 23 years old. Tony Finau, who seems to be getting himself in contention every day, every year. Bryson DeChambeau, I personally don't care for this guy. I think he's a jackass, but he's there almost every week. Golf is in a great spot. The sport is deeper than maybe ever. Tiger Woods, non-factor. Phil Mickelson, non-factor. Rory McIlroy, non-factor. So you're looking at guys who are the biggest name in golf. They were non-factors. Yet a tournament goes off and goes off and plays great. And down the stretch, it was as intriguing as anyone, as any tournament there was. I think at one point there were seven guys tied for the lead. Fantastic. The depth of golf has been great. And as much as, and I'm a Tiger guy, and I'm sure there are a lot of Phil guys out there 
who, who want to see them play well, as much as I enjoy that, seeing new blood and seeing the strength of this has been fun as well. Four weeks left in this season. Four weeks left. There's tournament this weekend, the Wyndham Championship, then the three FedEx Cup championships. The U.S. Open, September 17th, so a little over a month away. You'll see that. Then, of course, the Masters in November. If you're a golf fan, this has been a great season for you in spite of the way COVID has affected the sport. I think it's been as interesting on TV as any other sport could hope to be. Well, interesting, yes. Great, no. Major League Baseball continues on, and you've got things going on now with the Cardinals. They've had more people test positive. They're shut down until at least Friday. You've got the Indians sending two pitchers home because they broke quarantine. One of them was sent home, and he had to drive home. The other was allowed to fly in the team plane, which I, I don't understand the logic there, other than one's a really good pitcher and one was a guy who's barely on the team. The Yankees haven't rolled since I gave them so much props last week, but Giancarlo Stanton is hurt again. And, you know, to me, this was like, yeah, okay. Stanton and Judge are very much the same guy for the Yankees. They're the same player. And while Yankee fans don't like Giancarlo Stanton, they love Aaron Judge. And if you say they're the same guy, Yankee fans get all upset and, and, and hate the fact that you compare the two. But if you look at their games played over the last couple of years and you look at their numbers, they're very, very similar players. And they share something as far as brittleness that keeps them off the field. So the Yankees have injuries. But, you know, here's a team that have a guy in Clint Frazier who he is not a Yankee guy. He's a Yankee player. He's not a Yankee guy. He doesn't shut up and go along with the act. He doesn't, he's not willing to conform to the Yankee way, but he's got a great amount of talent. Whether or not he'll ever achieve it, especially in New York, remains to be seen. But I honestly think with Judge, I'm sorry, with Stanton getting hurt, this is a time where you got to look at this and give Frazier the at bats. Allow this young man to, to play the rest of the season and see what you've got. Aaron Hicks is not performing. And I know you're paying him a bunch of money and you still got a bunch of years left on that deal. But he's not performing right now. Brett Gardner's got three home runs. I think he's got like three other hits. He's not performing. These are guys who have been given a great chance. And Hicks, again, his defense makes it so that you want him in center field. But Clint Frazier's too good to not have there. And I really think this is a time where the Yankees need to just say, Okay, you're going to play every day. Show us what you've got. And, and just see. Sit back and see what this kid can deliver. Because one of two things is going to happen. He's going to sink or swim. And if he swims, then you've got either depth for your organization or you've got a trade piece going forward that everyone else in the league would love to have. Because I really think his bat is that good. I, I think i got to do a weekly segment about the Mets as the Mets mess turns. The Mets are a joke. We, they're a clown show. We talked about it last week as a Mets fan. I can't ignore what goes on. This week's update is the fact that Marcus Stroman has now opted out the pitcher who the Mets gave up a couple of prospects who are doing great in Toronto. Anthony K is got like a, a one ERA and his couple starts with the Blue Jays. Simeon Wo Richardson Woods is also somebody that the Blue Jays love. Yeah, well, you know, thanks. Here's a couple of prospects. Give us a guy that won't play for us. Stroman was hurt at the beginning of the year and has now decided to opt out. He's done so after a point where he gets service time for this year. So he'll be a free agent next year. The scary thing to me with Michael Waka going on the DL is that Brody Van Wagenen, who's shown a propensity to spend prospects like a drunk spending dollars at a bar, is just going to try to save his ass and save this season 
look, he's going to get fired as soon as the new ownership group comes in. As the Mets turn this week, last night I think they gave up two touchdowns to the Nationals. It's brutal. It's a brutal situation. The Mets have a, a big problem on their hand in that they don't have enough starting pitchers. Oh, I can't talk about the Mets' lack of starting pitcher without mentioning Zach Wheeler, the guy they chose not to make an offer to. He has been one highlight in an otherwise poor Philly season, allowing only three earned runs in his first couple starts for the Phillies. Yeah, so as the Mets turns, the Mets continue to sink. One thing that went on this week, again, was the Astros brawling. If you remember, the Astros cheating scandal came about because Mike Fires, a pitcher now of the A's, formerly of the Astros, blew the whistle on them. So the Astros didn't like that very much. Ramon Laureano was hit by a pitch three times, including Sunday afternoon. When he got to first base, he and Alex Cintron, who is the hitting coach for the Astros, had an exchange. This is what happened. So there's Laureano. He's they're chirping at him from the dugout. And Laureano. He doesn't get to whoever it was. Bregman got him first, looked like. It was Dustin Garneau who grabbed Laureano and took him. Yeah, that's Garneau, you're right. A lot of people are looking at baseball. Well, there's no social distancing there. I'm going to ignore that part of it because that's just something that people are going to love to say, especially since baseball has handled the pandemic as poorly as possible. I'm going to talk about Alex Sintra, the hitting coach for the Astros, who is a hold me back guy. And there are a lot of bad guys in the world. There's a lot of bad guys in the world. Speakerphone guy is a bad guy. You know, you're walking to Wegmans and dudes on speakerphone. Why? I, I don't want to listen to your part of the conversation, let alone the entire conversation. You've got the I'm taking up three parking spots guy. That's a bad guy. But hold me back guy might be the worst guy ever. And Alex Cintron is hold me back guy. He, he waved him forward. Come on, get some. And Laureano, Laureano decided, yeah, I'll go get some. Okay. Then three players step in front of Alex Cintron. Well, uh, no. Look, you want to be a tough guy. You want to be a man. You're, you're inviting everyone over. Nobody should hold you back. If you're going to run your mouth, stand there and be a man. Otherwise, get the hell out. And if you're in baseball right now and you're the hold me back guy and you start something like that, you're out of baseball. Get rid of this freaking guy. He has no business ever being in a dugout again. He should be suspended for life for what he did. And not because of the pandemic, because he's an asshole. He's holding me back, guy. Get rid of him. Alex Citron, I, I cannot, I can't imagine how many guys are looking at him and don't like him in his own dugout. Why do I got to clean up his mess? Why do I got to protect him? Because he's running his mouth. Shouldn't be that way. You're going to be a tough guy. You're going to stand there and challenge somebody. Don't be hold me back guy. At least man up and, and take care of the job yourself. Horrible. The Cardinals, as I mentioned, aren't playing until Friday. They are in, in deep, deep trouble. We have a baseball season where some teams have played 18 and 19 games. Other teams have played five. We're playing a 60-game schedule. How is this going to resolve itself? You start to look at the standings this morning. You start to look at teams that are 10 and 6, 11 and 6. The Marlins are 7 and 3. They're in first place. You've got teams, though, that aren't going to play more than a couple games. The Cardinals are 2 and 3. They're in second place because their winning percentage is better than the 7 and 9 Cincinnati Reds. Are they going to be a playoff team? 
there's got to be something done about this. I know the owners, all they care about is getting to the postseason, letting there be a postseason, letting television televise the games and pay for that so the owners can make money. That's all they care about. That's all that matters. This is a joke. And, and where's leadership? Nowhere to be found. I, I have no idea how they're going to handle this, but it is absolutely ridiculous to think that we have a season right now where you get a team in second place that's played five games and they are ahead by a half game of the team in third place who's played 16 games. It's absolutely ludicrous that this has gone on. So Major League Baseball, again, in the spotlight. But here in Western New York, the spotlight for Major League Baseball has been quite different. Salem Field, or Salem Stadium, in Buffalo will now be the home of the Toronto Blue Jays. The Blue Jays haven't had a home game yet. They are 9-8 and eight at this point, 17 road games. They finally get themselves a home game. Look how happy the players were to walk out under the field in Buffalo. The job that the Blue Jays organization has done refurbishing or finishing, however you want to say it, Salem Stadium has been nothing short of amazing. If you've seen the before and after pictures online, just crazy. They painted it all blue to make it look like the Blue Jays Sky Dome where they play. There's also, they've taken old hitting cages and made bigger locker rooms to allow for social distancing. They have done a phenomenal job. They put a new infield in. So it's going to be a great place to play. And Frankly, I think it'll play very well on TV. Let's face it. The one thing that's weird about watching baseball right now is these big cavernous stadiums with no people in them. The fact that the Jays are going to be playing in a smaller venue, I think it's going to work pretty well. Playoff baseball potentially at Buffalo? Yeah, sign me up for it. I know we as fans can't go to see it, but I think it's pretty cool. Tonight, May August 11th, as we record this, the Marlins and the Jays play the first game. New lights, they're all LED now. It'll be great to, to hear how things go. I'm sure there's going to be a few things that need to be tweaked going forward, but I really think it's very commendable what the organization has done, what Major League Baseball has done, what the city of Buffalo has done to allow this to happen. And frankly, I don't know that this is just a one-year experiment at this point. I think this is something that as this pandemic continues to go on and our lack of handling it well could go into next year and Canada could very well say, no, you're not playing here next year as well. And with all the money that they put in, that means next year too, potentially major league baseball happens in Buffalo. And frankly, I'm all in because I'd love to be able to drive an hour and a quarter or an hour and 15 up the throughway to be able to see a Major League Baseball game. It would be a fantastic thing. Well, the NHL has ended its qualifying. They're playing rounds, if you will. Although maybe it should be viewed more as a play-out round. Pittsburgh's out. Toronto's out. Edmonton, Nashville, the Rangers are out. Big-name teams not advancing to the playoffs. And the playoffs are set, and it should be a very good playoff. Look, NHL playoffs are some of the best things in sports. It's going to be a little different this year, I think. But the feel, once they drop the puck, will be the same. It's going to be great television. If you're a hockey fan, this is Christmas in August because this is going to be a very good thing. The teams that were out all went into a lottery to find out who was going to get the number one overall pick, if you remember the lottery, the unnamed te team won the lottery back in June. Well, 
now all those teams were in. And the prize this year is a legit prize. Alexis Lafreniere is a generational talent. He's a left winger, and he is viewed as somebody who could potentially be a Sidney Crosby, Connor McDavid type of player. He is that well regarded. Yesterday was the lottery within the lottery, and there was some conspiracy theory, you go with that, that allowed the Rangers to win. People are saying that the ping pong ball that the Rangers used was a little heavier because the man dropped it when he was placing it in the bin. So that was the one that was picked. You remember the 85 NBA draft lottery, the first one ever, the frozen envelope, allegedly, that allowed the Knicks to get Patrick Ewing. Well, now the Rangers get a guy as well. And, And last year they had the second pick. They missed out on Jack Hughes. But they did go Capo Caco, who this year had a decent rookie year. It wasn't a great rookie year, but he was a second overall pick last year. Now you get the first overall pick and a generational talent as well. So the NHL ongoing. Boston Carolina is a 4-5 matchup in the East. I think that'll be a great series. And keep an eye on the Blackhawks. They, they played their way into this. They are the eight seed. They play number one seed Vegas. And as much as I hope the Golden Knights advance, something tells me this is not going to be an easy 1-8 series in the Western Conference. So the NHL doing things the right way. They're even cheating the right way. Connor McDavid went to Edmonton. Worst case scenario. You didn't want Connor McDavid in Edmonton if you're Gary Bettman. He's the best player in the NHL. You don't want him where people can't watch him. Well, lesson learned. Lafreniere. He'll be, uh, he'll be in New York. He'll be on TV every day. And that's good work by Gary Bettman. Gary Bettman's a guy I've been criticizing for years. He's gotten a labor extension done during the pandemic, and now he's learned to cheat to put the right guy in the right place for his television views. Gary Bettman's growing on me, got to tell you. The NBA bubble is winding down, and you know this was obvious that this was going to happen. Early on, the games were intense. They were great. You had teams jockeying for positioning. But you're basically just finishing up the season. And let's face it, they invited a couple teams like the New Orleans Pelicans because they wanted Zion to be on TV. They should have done what the NHL did. Again, Gary Bettman, smart. We're, We're just doing it so that the teams that really have a chance and really can play are going to play. They're going to play. And you're not finishing the season. You're playing a qualifying round. It's like the playoffs, only a little bit different. The NBA, they're finishing the season. And like any team that's eliminated, you're going through the motions. The play has really watered down, and the interest level has watered down. I find it funny that the two biggest stories in the NBA seem to be the Lakers and the Clippers. And nobody talks about the Clippers in a negative way ever. The Clippers are just that. The Lakers, if they don't win by enough or if they lose, the national talk shows, that's all they they talk about. And I'm always amazed that locally people don't care about the NBA that much here in Rochester, Western New York. There really isn't a big rooting interest. But nationally there must be because all the major talk shows, they continually talk about the NBA. It must be something where the ratings just seem to go up when you talk about the Lakers. Because if you tune in a national show, that seems to be a topic every day on every show. I I just don't see that much interest until they get into it, until the season gets to a point where you think it's going to develop a champion. I don't think most people will tune in. Right now, they're playing out the string, and it's just not that interesting. Maybe when the playoffs start, they'll tune it up. Remember one thing. When the playoffs start, there's one team in the East that nobody wants to win, but I think they have as good a chance to win the title this year as maybe anybody, and that's the Toronto Raptors. They have one of the best coaches in the league, Nick Nurse. They have Pascal Seacom, who just continues to grow into, I think, a superstar. And the experience they had last year in winning the title, I think, could go a long way to helping them this year. So keep an eye on that. While everyone wants the Celtics to come out of the East, 
because they'll be better for television. Keep an eye on the Raptors. I think they are the best team in the East. Before we get out of here, I want to remind you about Instacart. And again, groceries that can be delivered to your house in less than an hour. We're going to give you an opportunity. You want to click on the show notes and and get that click in because it'll give you free delivery on your first order of over $35. Saves you a trip to the store. And there's a lot of participating stores that do Instacart. You could just click on there. They'll pick out the best produce. They'll protect your eggs. They'll do all the things that you would do. So if you just sit home and relax, makes a lot of sense. And again, click on the show notes. Let them know we sent you. They will turn around and happily give you a free delivery on your first order over $35. So that's it for this week. Thanks for listening. Hope you have a great week. We'll talk again next week. I'm Carl Falk. This is a Falcon Around podcast.